So uh, I would uh, like to welcome everybody here to the 9 a.m. Sunday morning session of uh, uh, of the, the 2022, um, what is this, Cotisol International Conference. Yes, I, I kind of get mixed up between the, the different hats that I wear. Um, but uh, this morning we are, uh, we are, uh, blessed with Fred, not Frederick, Rick Dunn, who will be talking about those five forgotten minutes for creating a positive classroom environment. Uh, and he's going to share with us some, uh, his, his process uh, for, for using these key moments. So thank you uh, uh, for joining us and uh, welcome Rick Dunn. All right, thank you. Um, let me pull up my slides here. Just give me sure. one second. There they are. And I should screen share. All right. Can you see my slides? Yep. Yes. All right. Fantastic. So thank you for the introduction, Greg. And um, yeah, once again, my name is Frederick. But please feel free to call me Rick. And currently I teach at Purdue Northwest. And um, lots of my my typical research or my interests are in language teaching policy. However, today is a little bit more lighthearted and I just wanted to talk about something that's applicable and something that maybe we can reflect on together, which is those five to 10 minutes before class starts. Um, and so what sparked this idea is often I have to observe other instructors and you get into the classroom and it's just completely silent. You see the students in the seat, they're all staring at their cell phones quietly. The teacher's just standing there or sitting there, looking at the clock, just waiting for that minute hand to hit the 12. And then they have a smile on their face and they're ready to go. Um, and we can talk about that coming up uh, in the next slide, but I think there is a sense of not being authentic when that happens. Um, but so as my own experience, also as a student, and I think you, many of you can relate to this, those feelings, of pressure or anxiety, like, oh my gosh, class is about ready to start. You're thinking quietly to yourself. Um, all of these things are going on through your head. You're just waiting for that minute hand to strike for class to start. Um, and so I think these five to 10 minutes actually contribute a lot to this effective filter that Krashen often talks about and building this wall up. And we'll, we'll talk about that coming up. Um, so yes, why is it important? Um, as I just mentioned, Krashen's effective filter hypothesis, um, we as instructors need our students to feel comfortable, essentially. Um, if they're not feeling comfortable, the input and the output is going to lack um, from, from our students. And then first impressions, of course. Um, from the very first class, it sets a standard. So if we're not talking to our students, they know that we're not really interested from the beginning. Um, and also we know through, um, through other studies that students make impressions very quickly of their instructors or their teachers. And that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, and then there's this authenticity factor. We're always talking about authenticity and we have to have authentic materials. Our books need authentic this, authentic that. However, how authentic is it if you don't care about talking to your students, but then the minute hand strikes 12, and now we expect everyone to talk and it's gonna be a good old time. I, I think the students know that that's not real. And when you, when you present that to them, I think that has a damaging effect ultimately, or at least has a little bit of insincerity to it. Um, and then lastly, of course, we anyone that has a, a teaching certificate, they're always drilled with a communicative language teaching approach, which, always emphasizes speaking and getting together as groups and talking, but we don't want to talk until the, the clock spe speaks 12, but then we expect the students to just start talking to each other. So I think there is sort of a double standard there as well. Um, so that's this is why I would say this is important. And also, please feel free to stop me at any time if you have questions or you want to say something. Um, or you think something I said is ridiculous, you know, I'm always happy to, to have a challenging question. So the plan, uh, I have five steps, five tips, five tools that I like to implement for, for creating a better environment before in those first to five to 10 minutes. Um, 
we can discuss these together or depending on the time, we can maybe have some breakout rooms. We can, we can see what you would like to do. Um, yes, so there's five factors. And as I said, these, I, I, I didn't know what to call them, factors, tips, methods, tricks. It's, it's up to you as to how you wanna look at these. But the five factors before class starts that I like to think about, I, ca I categorize as names, humility, games, music, and following up. It's rather simple, um, but I think they all get to the point. And I came to these conclusions based on my experience. Um, I've been teaching for 10 plus years. And so um, you can hold it as advice and do with it as you wish, add to it, ignore it. Um, but these are things that have worked for me and I want to share them with you. Names. So as soon as a student walks into the classroom, you always go for the name. Good morning, whatever their name is. And there's no such thing as a name that's too hard to pronounce, all right? So even if someone has a difficult name, you can practice, get used to it. Um, and I think students actually prefer it if you try or you make the effort to pronounce their name as is. Um, and I think when you greet each student as they walk into the door by name, you're acknowledging their presence. They feel welcomed. And I would even say sometimes for myself even, it's a little bit challenging for those pesky students, you know, that might drive us all a little bit crazy. But I think when you, when you greet them by name, they feel welcomed and it's a clean start. It's a new day. Um, and it's important that everybody has that feeling as they walk into the room. So something just as simple as good morning or good evening, Jason, Sonny, Greg, whatever it may be, it's great to have you in the room today. Um, and of course you can follow it up with how's your evening been or how was your day or something of that nature, but name is the first step. All right. Humility, so this is, this is one that I find is something that I can talk to my students about the first five to 10 minutes before class starts. So I'm in class, I need to talk about something. I don't want us to just sit there in silence. And there's a few ways that I can express some humility to show that I'm not this omnipotent or omniperfect teacher that speaks perfect every language type of thing. Um, and so a couple of ways I do that, and depending on the age of the students you're teaching, there's a few things, these are a few things that have worked for me. Um, so for example, when I was working with middle school students in Korea, I, I would ask them for writing help. I was like, oh, I have to write this thank you card. And I don't know how to write gamsa habnida. And so I tried to write it on the board and they all laugh at me, of course, because I don't know how to spell it correctly. And it's very easy for them. Um, just just churn, turning the tables a little bit so that they can see that, yeah, I make mistakes too in language. I think builds that sense of community and then they feel more safe making mistakes. Um, so it's just a great way to, to share um, with younger students and that's a simple one. Um, I'll skip to this third one here. Uh, so my, my wife is Korean and my, my father-in-law, he's also Korean. So often with my adult students, one of the stories I like to share with them is uh, I was introduced to my father-in-law's friends and in doing so, I went to bow, but instead I made like a ski bow or like an Olympic bow where my arms went back like this and I bent over and my father-in-law looked embarrassed. My wife didn't know what I was doing. It was, it was humiliating as all get out. Um, and of course, all my students laugh when they hear this. And then we talk about language and how we make mistakes and it's part of the learning process. And I guarantee I never bow with my hands behind my back like I'm going down a ski hill anymore. Um, but I think in talking about these things, it, once again, it creates a sense that we're, we're welcome to be working together and mistakes are welcome, right? I'm not, I'm not perfect and I'm willing to share my mistakes with them and they give me feedback and they'll even tell me, no, 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 teacher, you should do it like this and give me demonstrations sometimes. And I, and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, good. <clears throat> Questions so far? It's rather straightforward, but yeah. And also, yeah, well, I'll get to that later. 
Uh-oh, what's going on? There we go. Games. Um, another fun thing and easy way to break the silence in the beginning is our games. And there are three. Oh, yes, Greg. Where Sorry, I, I, I don't know if your chat is open there, but there was a question from Anna. Can you? Oh. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Thank you, Anna. Do you have some strategies for remembering your students' names, especially when you have a big class size? Um, I always have a roster list. And one thing that I do do is if I do find a particular name to be difficult, I always spell it phonetically next to the name so that it gives me a little bit of help from when I'm trying to remember how to pronounce the name correctly. Um, yeah, so I always have a list and yeah, I, I don't know how big of class sizes you have, but the biggest class size I have is around 30. And by the time the first week is over, usually you get it. So I think, of course, if you have like a lecture size with 100 students, I don't know if that's going to be possible. Does, does that help any, Anna? Thank you, Anna. All right. Uh, and thanks for getting that to me, Greg. I'll try to keep a better eye on the chat here. Um, ah, so yes, games. So just out of curiosity, has anyone used Wordle in the classroom before? Yes, one. Just, just Greg. All right, good. And Let's try it. Online class. Uh, yeah, world, Wordle. All right, um, Greg. Is it permissible for me to to show today's Wordle? Is that is that a? Yeah, I think I've done it. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know what yours will be there. I don't know if it's the same all over the world at the same time. Okay, yeah, we can we can look. I have it. So I see it's it. not well, illegal. We'll let we'll okay, let you. Okay, that's, that's my, <laughs> that was my concern. All right. All right. So this is Wordle. And since we have a mostly uh, silent class today, or a chat class, uh, feel free to, to participate here. So what Wordle is, it's a very simple word guessing game and it has five characters and it's something you can do before class starts. Today was, was rather tricky actually. Um, so for example, you would guess a word on the, the top. So you might ask a student, um what what might work here so you'd fill in a word so for the sake of time today we'll guess laser as our first word oh and now we know the first two characters are l and a and our lap and we know that there's an r but we don't know where it belongs um does somebody have another guess for us word wise Did, did you have this one today, Greg? No, it's, uh, um, it's my, different. my, yeah, different one. Uh, yeah. Good to know. Anyone? No? Sunny, BJ, Roxy? I, I actually had, don't know about it, but, <laughs> but I am not quite good at it. Do you, you did today's or you have a guess? Um, What we could put here l a could, could be large but e, large? Is not it. Lar e is not in it though well we, we might get some characters so sure. we could try large yes large oh. Oh, oh, oh i will i will give you a hint for those living in korea there's a famous cartoon kids cartoon and it has to do with bugs oh, right got it Everybody knows they're going to kick themselves when they realize. No. You see it in, in advertising on the subway lots of times. Yeah, on the bus. On the bus. No. Chrysalis? I don't know if that's... I'll give you a... The last one is an A, too. Oh, we got it. We got it? Yeah, Sunny. Oh, very good. Thank you, Sunny. Excellent. But... Uh... Ta -da. Ta -da. So this this is Wordle, and this is a simple game that you can can have with the students. Once again, I think what it does do 
is it helps lower that effective filter. We're not there, oh my gosh, what is he gonna ask us today? Like, oh, I forgot to do my homework. Like, it helps diffuse the classroom setting. Um, let me go back. Oh, another one that is, here we go, is Wordle. So we have Wordle and Wordle. And this one is similar, but this is geographically. So for example, you could take a guess as to which country this is. Does anybody, you can throw it in the chat. Interesting how it doesn't tell you about double letters. Oh uh, right. yes. So you, you can guess again with two letters and it will tell you, but then yes, it's a, it's a little bit tricky. But does anyone have a, a guess about which country this might be? Uh, how long does it usually take to, so I can usually get these games done within five to 10 minutes when I'm working with my college students. They're, and they're usually intermediate speaking students. Um, but depending on the word, so like I usually check the word first before class. So something like larva is rather, it's a little bit more tricky, but if you, if you screen what word is gonna be used for the day, I, you can use it to your best judgment then. Yeah, so Wordle is once a day and it's produced by the New York Times. They do it once, once a day. So there's, there's one per day. Yes, on any, on any given computer and it's on the New York Times website as well. Oh yeah, so, so usually what I do is I do it on a separate device just to screen it. And then like in the classroom, there's a, a computer that I can use as well. Thank you, Lisa. Do we... Oh no, it's it's not linked to the to your Google account. Uh, Google can link to everything. All right, <laughs> uh, Greg or anyone, do, do we have a guess yet on as to which country this might be? Just give any random guess. Someone someone can type it in the chat. I'm not uh, typing, but I think like. Uh, like yeah. Azerbaijan, and Austria. To... Oh, we got an Austria. In okay, chat. we'll try it. We'll see. So you can do this, and so we know that we're nine thousand five hundred and fifty-seven kilometers. Are the country that it is is that far away to the southwest? So we have to go southwest from Austria by this many kilometers, almost ten thousand kilometers. So it's like on the African continent, maybe? Yeah, that's what I said. Perhaps Northern Africa somewhere. Let's go with Egypt. Egypt. All right. Yep. We can try that. Egypt. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, now we have to go west 11,000. Oh. Kilometers. Newfoundland? Is it part? Can it have to be country Newf or part? That, yeah, it might be. Let's just. Ah, good question. So logistically, how does this work with a class of 30 students? Are students shouting out answers in the class? So this is the five to 10 minutes before class starts. So students are trailing in, right? So usually there's like, you have some students are there very early. You have some students that are there late. Um, so actually the late thing I'll talk about later, but yeah. So I, I think usually even if you have a class of 30 students in the beginning, there's not 30 students there. Um, and this is before class is happening. And if they are shouting out, I, I think it's fine um, because it's, it's sort of diffusing the, the classroom environment. It's not a stressful, a stressful situation. Uh, hmm. No more guesses? No. You said Canada, right? Sure. Yeah, Newfoundland, Canada, yeah. Oh. Now we gotta go southeast. We're sort of getting closer. Um, okay. Jason, I feel like you might have an idea for Sunny. Oh, 
Brian, you got something for us? <laughs> All right. Oh, that might be a good. Nah. Thank you, Lisa. Let's try it. Oh, no, you can look at a map. That's fine. We didn't, we didn't set that. Nicaragua. Oh, we're much oh. closer to Nicaragua. Could, oh, could be Venezuela or Colombia. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know which one? I'm not sure which one this is. Is this the last guess? This is the last guess. It's a lot of pressure. It is. <laughs> we'll go with Colombia or Venice. Maybe Venice. Colombia. Let's try it. Oh, there, you go. Oh, there we go. There we go. We oh, got it. God. Columbia. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. That was an excellent guess. All right. And then finally, there's there's one other. Uh, let's see here. And this one is, let's see. Where did I go? Oh, sorry. Hmm. Can you still see my screen? Yep. Uh, and this this game is called Language Squad, and this is a this is a great one also. Um, and this one can be played very quickly. So if you only have like a minute or two, um, and simply there's different settings where you can have a, like for example beginner audio, and you press play, and the students will hear a language, and then they can guess which language they're hearing. Are they hearing English, French, Chinese? And they they go they get extremely competitive with this one, actually. It's uh, it's quite fun. Um, and I think what's nice about this one also is since so many students have more than one language to begin with, they really like to team up with each other and ask each other, oh, you know this language, is it this one or is it that one? So they get to feel some sense of authority and it's it's fantastic. Um, I, yeah, they have a great time with this one. I would press play, but I don't, I tried it earlier in the, the volume doesn't, I have a problem with my speaker here. Um, yes, and so it's language squad and you can you can change the difficulty. So like if you go like medium, for example, you get other languages that are less common. Um, but then of course, if you have many different speakers in the classroom, they get more excited. So like I have Mongolian students, for example, and they, they're like, oh, I know what they're saying. And they, they get to explain everything to us. So it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic, tool to use before the class starts. Any other questions before I continue? All right. Sorry, are you uh, going to share the links for those or you want me to put these uh, up as we go? To these? Oh, yeah, what, could you, would you do, is that okay for you to sure, do it, Greg? Sure. Yep, I'll, I'll just keep adding them as you go, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, another thing that I, I've come to find, especially through, through observations and for this, this time before class starts is, is music. And I do wanna, I don't know, put a prereq or make a note though for the, the music. I, I have observed classes and it, where the music is just meant to sort of mute the class. It's so loud that nobody can talk to each other and it's sort of playing onto the students. And, I'm not advocating for that, okay? What, what I am advocating though, is, is something that I like to do, oh, uh, um, is that you can, you can play, you can get to know your students' music interests. And one way to do that is by simply, if you have a class website, it's very simple. You can create uh, a place where students can share music and you can set standards um, for what's appropriate or talk to your class depending on their age level as to what music they can or should not share. Um, some, I know some people like to say no music videos, only lyrics only. Um, that, um, so it depends on, on who you are. Oh, sorry, thank you for, for letting me know that. Da -da -da -da. There, can you see my PPT now? Okay, good. Thank you, Jason. Um, so yeah, so uh, as I was saying, music is a great tool to, to uh, to sort of get to know your students as well. And 
you can create different places for them to share the music. Another thing you can do is create a playlist on YouTube. Um, that's that's another thing that I, I've done where students can give me their recommendations. And then I listen to the music, especially if it's with younger students, just to make sure that the language parents aren't going to be upset, that type of thing. Um, so do some screening and make sure that you set the prerequisites first for what's appropriate for sharing music. Um, but with that said, one of the, the best things about sharing music with students in the classroom is that if you actually take the time to listen to it and then you come back the next day and you talk and you say, oh, I listened to that song. I know what unana means now. And like unana, and then they're all laughing. Oh, unana, that's that's Mongolian. And it means like, it's cute and something something of that nature. They, like the excitement before class starts and the connection that you get over music is, is one of the best things you can do. And then I have students now that come 10, 15 minutes early now because they want to share new songs they found with me. Oh, teacher, you have to listen to this, listen to this song. I found this song, I want you to hear it. Um, and just having this before class starts really eases the class. Like, and then the students are talking to each other about what music that they like. Um, and it creates a really nice class cohesion. Um, and it, I, I, can't, I can't stress it enough. Um, Ah, so so yeah, so for for the recommendations, sometimes they come come straight to me, uh, and they they show it to me on their phone or ask me to look something up on the on the computer before class starts. And and as I said, also on our course website, you can sort of see it. I put it in the background here. Like I have like an ESL one twelve class playlist. The students go there and they can post the music that they like, and then we talk about it. Um, and then you can see that these are songs uh, in the background as well. Um, because we probably want to screen a song before playing it. Um, yes, I, I agree, Jason, you, you would want to screen a song. Well, it depends on the age of your students. So if you have younger students, I, I agree. But if you have older students, you know, if you, if you tell them beforehand, like, hey, I prefer you not to share music that has swearing or you make some, some guidelines for them, and they understand those guidelines. You know, I I trust my students to to follow that, so I, I don't usually worry about it. Um, good question, though. Yeah. Okay. Um. I, I'm sorry, Lisa. Is this is this a, a are you just talking about the the traditional ABC song, or is this something new that I don't know about? Seems like Jason might know this too. Ah, uh, it's a new song. Oh, uh, sorry, Lisa. I can't hear you. Your mic is muted. It must be something you haven't encountered yet, but because it goes all the way, you think they're like, oh, it's an alphabet song, and then suddenly it's like, F you. It's like, okay, oh, then, <laughs> wait a minute here, let's just settle this down. I see. Oh, well, thank you for making me aware of that. Yeah. Uh, take a look. It's been out there a while, but uh, I'm sure it'll pop right up as soon as you Google. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's good. Um, yeah, so we do have to be aware of, aware of that. Um, and you, you also can judge after you know your class for a while. I think you can you know what to feel comfortable with and what not to feel comfortable with. I think each class is a little bit different, um, and you get to know those pesky students, as I said earlier too. So um, just just uh, be cautious. But I, at the sake of, what was I going to say? I would still say though, at the sake of a bad word escaping or a negative song, it's still worth this this activity before class starts just to get to know your students and to help them relax a little bit um, I yeah I can't recommend this enough I think it's it's a fantastic way because I think it's part of the the human connection is music as well and it's it's a universal language so when we hear uh, music um, all right I got questions here. Da -da -da -da. 
Uh, and so then the lastly, the, the final factor, and I, and I hinted with this with the, the music is, is following up with your students. So if, if they tell you something about their, their personal life before class starts or after class or you know things about them, you know, this is a time where you're not, you're not going into class time, right? This is a time where you can say, oh, how was skateboarding last weekend? Or how was, oh, that song was so great. Like, I really like this, but every time I try to pronounce this, like, um, it's difficult, can you help me? Um, di different things like this. It shows that you were sincere. And this is the sincerity or the authenticity that we're always talking about is having this ability to follow up. And I think the more classes you have, the more difficult it is. So once again, like I said, I always have like a roster list and I always make little notes next to people's names as to, oh, um, Chani talked to me about this today. I'm gonna be sure to follow up with him to, uh, on Thursday or, or something of that nature. I think following up with your students shows that you're actually interested in them. Um, and, and then this follow-up makes them eager to talk to you also. I, this is what I found for myself. And as I've been practicing these, these five simple things, what's happened over time that's been the most beneficial for me is that my students get to class on time and they get there early now. They, they want to be there. Um, so they, they want to tell me what's going on and they want to share things with me and with each other. And uh, it's, it's really fulfilling when that happens, right? So like I, I told them now, like they can't come earlier than 15 minutes. Like that's, that's the max, like we can't do more than that. Um, but following up with them or like the students who helped me write a card, right? Oh, thank you for writing that. The, the person who received it understood exactly what I wrote. Thank you for that. Um, so being thankful and, and sharing with them is, is essential. Um, yeah. Oh, chat question here. Right, it is, a, it is a great problem to have, uh, Greg. And yeah, um, with this said, I guess what I, I was thinking, or it's, it's up to you, we have a fairly silent and chatty chat box kind of class, and that's fine. I understand it's early in the morning. Um, uh, we can either, if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer more questions, or also we could, if you want to do some role playing, we could do like some breakout rooms and we could have uh, like a student teacher, we could designate certain people as a teacher and the rest can be students. We could probably have two, two breakout rooms. I don't think I have the ability to poll, I see. Um, to poll? Yes. Uh, yeah, you have to... Do you have the ability to pull? I can do it here. I just don't know. Uh, how do I share that to you? I've never shared a poll to somebody. You have to create it. That's the thing. Right. Okay. Yeah, we can do a poll with hands raised. Uh, hands. Thank you, Lisa. That's a genius. Look at this, look at this group. <laughs> so yeah, if, <laughs> um, if you would like to to do a little role play, we can break up the rooms. Why don't you go ahead and give me a, a hands up? I got one. We could do three rooms of three. Okay, yeah, we could do that. Oh, two or three. I've lost one person there. two rooms and and what do you want them to do in their rooms so you can you can sh um one person can take on the role of of the teacher essentially and welcome each person and then engage them in conversation you can talk about something goofy you've done in korea or what you have for connecting with large classes of students uh yeah okay jason good question we can i can answer that really quick any, any other tips you have for connecting with large classes or students? Um, I think 
with with large classes, actually, the the names is the most important. At least that's what I I found because it's easy to sort of forget people in large classes. So by greeting each person that walks into the door, at least from the very beginning, you're you're acknowledging the person. Um, yeah, and I think yeah, if we all can share, I think that would be great too. Um, so yeah, I think I think names is extremely important for the larger classrooms, and and by knowing the names. Uh, I think it helps ensure that you're you're interacting with each student, so you're not forgetting someone. So just uh, putting an emphasis on on remembering who's in each of your classes. Does does anyone else have some? Oh, Greg, yes. Well, just to follow up on that, because I was thinking that a lot of uh, the people here that in Korea, they're maybe transitioning from from online classes to face to face you know as the rules are you know slowly changing and things are opening up um so it occurs to me that um the uh, being online they may not know the students or they may not recognize the students when they see them face to face and there's that sort of a like the beginning of the term getting learning names all over again um uh sort of problem i guess that, that that's going to exist for us um, you did mention something there that, that might help with that. And that is using the roster and putting like a trigger word or uh, some, something that's a reminder or a hint as to who th this person is, you know, the one wearing glasses or oh, yes. the one in the pink top or something like that. Yes. Yeah. But does anyone else have some suggestions? Jason, do you have any yourself? I'll come on quickly before I have to get ready for my presentation next, Rick, but I just want to say thank you for your presentation. Um, for me, I have classes of 40 students and I have like seven, eight classes. So the name wow. thing is a bit challenging. What I do every semester with my classes is a kind of interest inventory. So I have a bunch of categories like where they live, um, do they have any pets, their part-time job, club activity, as well as their favorite movies and music and stuff. And they all fill it out. That's their homework for the first week. And they share their uh, Google Doc link into a class sheet. So the whole class has access to all the students in the class and their interest inventory. So I start off my classes the first few weeks. Um, they have new seats in the class. They say hello to their new classmate. They open up that interest inventory. And they have a conversation using that. So trying to find similar interests to help them make friends more easily, or if there's anything that's interesting that stands out, like I don't know this movie or I don't know this band, or I've never been to this country that you went to, it kind of helps facilitate conversation. So that's usually how I learn about new music from their recommendations, but the class playlist you recommended, I had been thinking about doing that for a while, but I haven't actually figured out how to go about it. So I think I want to try that this semester just to have their input into the, the music that I've been using. Yeah, and one thing, Jason, that it was sort of, I, I take their like their initial class playlist and I take the titles of their songs to make like a, like a, by a, I don't know, an analysis of the class itself to like in a joking manner. So I say like, we have a bunch of like heartless romantics in this. Like, mm -hmm. uh, they, I think it's pretty funny. But th thank you, Jason. Those were those were fantastic ideas. I like the categorization, like where they're living. Like that's I really like that. Thank you. Yeah, but I think the theme of this is great. Like definitely, especially coming from online classes to face to face, it's really important to get students' effective filter down and to make them comfortable. Like positive psychology is one of my main like interests. So. I think you can't have real learning until the students are comfortable with you and each other. So, yeah, this was a really great presentation, Rick. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Jason. Thank okay. you. Um, Greg said, how do you create your class playlist? Is this on YouTube or a separate document? I think I think you could do whatever works best for your class and uh, what resources are available to you and your students, right? So. If your students have access to YouTube, I, I would say that's fine. I and mean, if your students are in, are in a place where due to internet restrictions, they don't, well then yeah, you might have to make a, a class list. Um, I, 
this is a different topic. I always feel a little bit uncomfortable asking students to use a VPN to access things. Um, I don't think they should have to do that to do their coursework. Um, so I'm going to be part of the class. Uh, so thank you, Greg. Well, Lisa, did you want to say something? It looked like you were about to. You were asking how we um, learn our students' names and such. And I really think that somebody's name is like really important to them. So I always keep my students with their original Korean name, just make sure they learn how to spell it in English and everything. And along with that, I ask them like what their favorite colors are and then uh, how they prefer, like what sort of spelling they prefer the transliteration at. And then I just write it up on a card in calligraphy for them or like lately ribbon lettering. And they really love that. They, they feel so special. And even like a couple of them who really don't like to speak at all, they just get this look in their eye like, oh my gosh, she's asking me. And yeah. when I show it to them, they're, they're just so happy. So it works really well. And it helps me focus on their name and who they are because as I'm writing it ever so slowly, I just have to pay attention to what's going on. And it helps the process. Yeah, excellent, Lisa, yeah. Um, the spelling of the name, I, I haven't thought of that before, but yeah, I think that's that's equally important as well as how, we're, how, how we are spelling it and letting because students have that. There's the standard letter spelling, but sometimes that just looks really off in English. and. And it makes it so much longer, right? So if I suggest like EO, in, or if I say like put a short U instead of an EO, some of them are just happier but that it's shorter. Yeah. And, and Greg also mentioned Melon is a, is a popular source for, for sharing music. Um, yep. Um, yeah, yeah, very good. Um, any, any other questions? I think okay. you've uh, you've touched on a a lot of really good timely stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think you know just even from the responses that that we're getting in chat and in the the uh, spoken responses. Um, uh, although I think people are you know they're they're right now they're a little torn with so much that's going on in the conference right now um, that uh, you know they may be a little bit. Uh, uh, their their attention is split, but sure. uh, but absolutely, the, I agree with uh, with what the one uh, person said. Jason, I think, said that uh, uh, really perfect for this uh, point in time, especially uh, since we're we're in this transition period and that we're we need to reconnect with our students yeah. in the classroom. Yeah. All right. Well, well, thank you, everyone. I... I appreciate your, your questions today. And if you have any, any follow-up questions or would like to ask something in the, in the future, I have my contact information